is about this is one of the major challenges trying to get all of this data that's out there is to find a way to put it in context that people can understand, both in its, uh, basically its scale and scope of what's going on. So let's get the first slide up, just a second. That's the one. Okay, now part of this, a lot of this is gonna be redundant because frankly we've all seen this. Um, the main purpose behind this is to bring people who don't have a lot of background up to speed of what's actually going on. You ready? Next slide. First of all, we touched on this, and what we've been talking about, and this is important, and this is the standard model that we've seen for a very long time. We know that that's not accurate anymore. There's been a lot of changes in the modeling. Um, obviously, the dike systems and everything floating on salt water, we know doesn't actually occur. Next slide. We've also seen a whole series of models that have come all across. These are a mixture of every, all of them that are out there. First of all, you have the dikes, you have the faults, and then, of course, you have the layer cake or the flows. Uh, the reality is it's a combination of all of them. And we're almost certain that there's layer upon layer and crossovers. Where are all of them? We're not entirely sure. Next slide. The biggest thing, and this touches on the layer cake side, is what is missing, all right? And it has to do with the lateral flows, both above and below sea level. We talked a lot about perching. Um, we also talked about the water flowing underneath. But what does that really mean? How is this moving around? And the honest truth is we don't really know right now. There's a lot of water moving around. Next slide. This is the actual borehole. Now this is prior to the well being cased or reamed. It's about an eight inch hole and we're about 100 feet above sea level. You've seen pictures of this, but this really shows you that the water is flowing well above sea level through those layers. Now it has been said that this is a fairly unusual feature and that is true. You don't see this very often in wells, but it does show up in a couple others. Now, okay. Come on when everybody's opening doors. Anyway, um, we do have seen this in a couple other wells. More importantly though, the question is how common is this particular aspect throughout the islands? Well, the reality is the flowing perched aquifer is fairly common. Another example of that, please go to Bond. This is in Kohala, and this will show you a good example of the layers themselves. Now, obviously the geology in Kohala is a lot older, but as you crawl into the actual tunnel, you can see you have the perching layer right here, which is an ash layer, not horribly thick. Then you have a conglomerate of small clinker that the water is actually flowing through. This is about 800 feet above basal, so we're quite a ways up. And you can also see there's quite a bit of water flowing through that particular area. On an even larger scale, though, is one in Hilo. And this is up at over 2,000 feet. Now, what's interesting about this particular feature is this is an old lava flow with a younger lava flow over the top. The rainfall percolates down. The older lava flow is less permeable. That allows the water to flow along the surface and has an outfall point right at this spring location. Now, what's even more interesting is you see a waterfall. Well, why would you cut a waterfall underground like that? For the best reason you can imagine, and that is right at the base of the waterfall, there's another tunnel. And what happened was when they were chasing this water through the actual aquifer, they came across the impounding body. And the impounding body is a very, very dense, we believe it to be a trachyte, but once you crawl into that tunnel, there's no water flow, there's no airflow, there's no movement around you. A cloud actually forms around you in that tunnel. And you're beneath the spring, but all the water's actually flowing over the top of you. You have to climb up to around, get into the spring source itself, and this is the actual location where it's coming out. And I'll show you a pretty good shot of how the, the water's actually flowing through the different layers. Like I said, we're at over 1,000 feet here. And this particular spring in this setting was producing between three and five million gallons a day. Very large system, all flowing along, not going down up on Mauna Kea, but not going straight down into the basal lens or even the high level. This is moving its way down the mountainside in the Grok, but it's not actually um, down in any of the normal structures we even consider. I'll just let you watch because frankly it's kind of cool.
This area right here, you can see how the rock though doesn't look particularly permeable. That's the top of the, the uh, perching layer. When you go into it, it's a very, very hard rock, like I said, very few cracks. There's not even drips down below. It's almost a smooth tunnel. Okay, go back to the PowerPoint, please. The fact of the matter is we don't know where all of this is. We don't know the directions. You know, there's a big question as far as what's actually going on with it. There we go. Aquifer system. This, of course, is the standard. Um, we know, of course, the Keho Aquifer over here is part of the larger Hualalai system. We know that this is the rift zone. Biggest problem with this is this, of course, is in two dimensions. Just as Don spoke about, these lines are somewhat arbitrary. Now, granted, there are rift zones, and you're absolutely correct, and that will impede flows and slow things down, but we really don't know underground where the overlaps tie in. You have Mauna Loa, you have Hualalai, and all the different layers tying in. We don't know where those are. Next slide. Designation, we've talked about that. Next slide. Now, the reason we've talked about all these other elements, just seeing the water, the volumes, all that, really comes down to the scale of this. And this is where it gets really important. And it has to do with the water, the consumption here in the Keho Aquifer. Now, if you look at the timeline here, it's about 25 years. If you follow it in a straight line, you will notice that the increase is roughly 280,000 gallons a day per year. The reason that's important is when we talk about the sustainable yield, which we know is a whole other element, we talk about the different levels, before we get up against 100% of the sustainable yield is over 80 years. There's a very, very long time that this is going to take place over. It's not going to happen tomorrow. This is not something, you know, one of the elements with this, there's a sense of urgency that keeps getting thrown out there. We're not driving down the road with our eyes shut waiting for the airbags to go off. It's a different creature, okay? Yeah, I know you like that one. But it is very important to recognize that this is going to evolve over time. Because especially when you look at the next slide, this also shows you the scale. When we talk about the timeline to reach that, also think about the number of wells it would take. Look at how many wells you have in this region. These, of course, are the high level. These are the low level. And this, of course, is what is believed to be the impounding layer. Um, Steve, our senior partner, believed more faulting than their layering was involved in there. But again, there's a lot of discussion that can go on with that. But when you look at that sheer number of wells, and then you think about how much we'd have to increase, we're not gonna be drilling that many wells in any period of time. It's gonna be slow, it's gonna be developing, it'll take a long time to actually get to a point where we're gonna be bumping up against the limits. The caveat to that, though, is we also don't believe for a second that a low-level well down by Keoho is directly affecting high-level or even low-level up near the airport. This particular system crosses over, and this comes back to Don Thomas's uh, comments of observation. No matter what else happens, we need to commit to a long-term plan of observing, and as each will goes along, we basically make modifications or adjustments. The other thing is, as shown in the Kahalu shaft, which is very important, is almost all of this is reversible. In other words, when a problem begins to arise, if you change your pumping, if you even have to close out a well, the system reverts back very quick, quickly. Dave has been doing the testing in the Kohana, Kohana Iki area for coming up on seven years. We have had a couple instances, and I might have you talk about that, Dave, if you don't mind, where we have seen things show up, um, basically because of management. Once we shut that down, it immediately reverted. Do you want to talk about that for a second, Dave? Uh, I'm sure most of you have already heard part of it, but generally, um, I do the, the monthly monitoring um, report to the Seymour, and occasionally, in some of the monitored wells, you can see tips and some of the uh, one notable one <laughs> was when the golf course had accidentally left a valve open. It's going to happen very slowly over time. There's a lot more data we need, and there's a lot of water moving around that we really can't account for at this time. Thank you. Okay. Aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Troy Sakihara. I am a biologist with the Division of Aquatic Resources uh, based in Hilo. Um, I was asked to give a presentation today on the biology and ecology of ankyline pools um, along the Kona coast uh, based on the work that I've done with DAR and also for my uh, master's thesis with, uh, at UH Hilo. So in the simplest terms, um, ankyline pools are basically landlocked brackish water pools uh, that are influenced by uh, ocean tidal fluctuations and uh, groundwater through subterranean connections. 
Um, there are approximately 1,000 ankyline habitats that are known worldwide. A um, little over half of these are found actually in Hawaii. And the majority and the highest concentration of these pools in Hawaii are actually found along the Kona coast of Hawaii Island. Um, unfortunately, nearly all of these uh, habitats are in some way degraded, altered, or completely lost. Okay. Oh yeah, one thing, sorry. So anchoring pools on Hawaii Island are typically found in bus uh, porous basaltic lava fields. Um, they, they range in all different sizes and shapes. They're relatively shallow, usually less than a meter deep. Um, they also uh, fall along a natural salinity and nutrient gradient uh, along this coastline. And they are considered ephemeral systems on a geological time scale, um, as they are really prone to senescence um, um, from natural events such as um, earthquakes, lava flows, um, tsunamis, and things of that sort. Now on the flip side of that, uh, new pristine ankylian habitats are easily formed by these na same natural events, um, assuming that uh, there's an absence of um, human, human disturb disturbance in the areas. Um, historically, ankyline pools uh, were valued um, as, a, as a precious water resource, especially in these arid environments, uh, as sources of water for drinking, agriculture, um, or bathing, and also um, sources of, for palu, for opelo fishing. Okay, next. Oh, yes. Okay. But the, the true gems of these ankyline pools are the unique biota that we find in these pools, as well as the fact that they provide windows to these unseen subterranean uh, interfaces of seawater and uh, groundwater. And this is just a representation of some of the unique um, endemic and native fauna that we, we find in these pools. Some of these are actually uh, exclusively found in Kau and South Kona. Okay. The most common species, uh, a lot of you know, is the Opai Ula, uh, which is primarily an herbivore. It intensively grazes on the microalgae that grows in these pools. Um, they, they thrive throughout a wide range of different habitat conditions, um, salinity ranges, and, and associated habitat conditions. Um, their presence or absence have become an indicator of the, the health of these ecosystems, where the presence of these opai ula in the ponds indicate a relatively healthy system versus the absence of these pool, uh, opai ula indicating some, some form of disturbance. Now, what hasn't been really um, studied or well understood are the, the effects of uh, elevated nutrient inputs into these pools and the impacts and the effects that it has on the microalgae that grows in these pool, uh, pools, the sources of food for these opai. And how, how that um, differs across these wide ranges of, wide range of habitat conditions that we find in these pools. And also the, the opposing effects of the grazing by the opai ula on, on these variables. So over the next several slides, I'm gonna be briefly summarizing the, the work that I did um, addressing these questions. So you can just click until they all show up. Yeah. 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 Okay. So these are the basic questions that drove uh, that drove my uh, driven my uh, talk or my study. Sorry. Uh, the first is how do salinity and nutrient concentrations affect primary productivity and algal biomass in these ankyline pools? So does nutrient um, elevated nutrient inputs differ? The effects of these nutrients does, do they differ? It, depending on the salinity levels and the habitat conditions that we find. Uh, the second question is, do specific nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, or a combination of these different nutrients have uh, distinct effects on the, the algae that grow in these ankyline pools? The third question is, how do the primary grazers, which are the opai ula, how do they affect the algal biomass? And do they mitigate the effects of these nutrients in the pools? And finally, what are the combined effects of salinity, nutrients, and the grazing biopiola? Bio so does nutrients have an overwhelming effect in these pools on the algal biomass? Or does opaiula trump the effects of nutrients? And does this depend on the salinity level in these pools? So this is just a basic uh, diagram uh, describing the design of my experiment. 
so basically what I wanted to do was sample the microalgae that grew in these pools by uh, deploying these terracotta plates in these ankylan pools for about a month, um, allow the algae to grow on the plates, I could scrape the algae off, and I could use those for analyses. Um, the first variable that I wanted to test was uh, salinity, so I chose pools that were either high, high, relatively high salinity of 20 parts per thousand or above versus low salinity pools which were less than 5 parts per thousand. Now within these salinity, two high, uh, high and low salinity pools, I set four different nutrient treatments. Uh, so some of the plates I enriched with nitrogen, some with phosphorus, uh, some with a combination of these two nutrients and a couple of control treatments uh, without any um, nutrient enrichments. And within these four treatments, uh, I left one plate open to grazing and the other I caged off and, to exclude the grazers from eating the algae off of the, pool, uh, the plates. Um, the, I, to run these experiments, I chose 11 pools across uh, the Kona Coast. Um, at Kapalawa, Akahukaimu, Veli Veli, and Dawan at Manukau in the south, at the south. Um, and the criteria that I used to choose these pools were based on uh, natural and relative, relatively undisturbed conditions, which consisted of open pools without any vegetation, uh, a lack of invasive fish, and an established uh, population of Opaiula. And all of these pools fell within one of those two salinity categories, high or low. So what I basically found was that uh, nutrients actually didn't have any significant effect on the microalgal biomass or the primary productivity in these pools. However, we did see a significant reduction in algal biomass and organic material by opaiula grazing. And we also saw a reduction in uh, primary production as well as um, organic material in lower salinity pools. And when you consider the, the the significant relationship between salinity, the negative relationship between salinity and nutrients, we, these results are actually uh, kind of unexpected. We, we're expecting actually the opposite. So, you know, in, in these uh, low salinity or high salinity pools, which ha actually have back, lower background nutrient concentrations, we would expect with increased nutrients would have a higher uh, significant effect by nutrient inputs, but that's not what we saw here. So what we can essentially infer from these results is that not all of the Hawaiian ankyline pools are nutrient lim limited, meaning that the, the concentrations of nutrients that are found in these pools naturally are high enough to sustain optimal microalgal uh, growth. Um, also, this also reinforces the idea that opaiula consistently play a key function in these ankyline pools across a range of different habitat conditions and nutrient background nutrient concentrations. So they are really engineering organisms that you know, maintain the biological and uh, ecological integrity of these ankyline pools. And finally, salinity may influence the microalgal community structure. Um, so it might influence the type of algae that's growing, uh, different functional algal groups, and therefore provide different food resources for the opai depending on the salinity and habitat conditions. And that in turn could it, uh, affect the trophic dynamics and the food web structure in these pools. Um, some other points to consider, um, the opaiula is the common shrimps, uh, as well as Metabateus lohana, which is this one, it's another common shrimp that we find throughout these pools. Um, we've, they seem to tolerate a wide range of habitat conditions, in other words, uh, wide ranging salinity. Um, and this has been attributed to their strong osmoregulatory traits, uh, which we find in opaiula. Um, and also um, in laboratory cultures, um, we actually find that the opaiula um, survival rates and reproductive rates are optimal between nine to 20 parts per thousand. Um, now, when we look at the, the less common species, um, they seem to be limited to higher salinity pools. So, uh, they may have different habitat requirements. But um, due to the rarity of these species, we, we really don't know that much about these, these, these uh, shrimps. Um, but we, they, what we do know is that they have a very wide distribution throughout the, in the Pacific, uh, which would suge suggest a larv oceanic larval stage. 
which would require a, a subterranean connection from these anchoring pools to the ocean. Okay. All right, so if we look at uh, some of the representative species that are found within these habitats that are highly influenced by, by groundwater, uh, for instance, uh, anchoring pools, we have Opaiula, as well as these ground groundwater-fed estuaries that we find along the Kona Coast. Uh, we see a relatively consistent pattern as far as uh, the, the, toler the salinity tolerance range. Um, and we find them across from nearly fresh water to seawater. And same thing with the native striped mullet. But we also see that they tend to prefer the more brackish, brackish water, the oligohaline to mesohaline conditions, as we see here. Whereas the, the native, uh, the endemic Orange black damselfly nymph actually has a more limited and restricted tolerance range, preferring slightly uh, fresher, fresher um, or lower salinity habitats. Okay. All right, so I've just looked to close uh, my talk uh, with this artwork here. I'm sure many of you have seen it before. I can play one. But I just want to superimpose the Upai Ula in there uh, just, to, just as a reminder that these these habitats, these anchoring pools, are a very unique and vital component of the island ecosystem that we have here. And I think the, um, this, art, this piece of art here actually it nicely depicts the, the idea of connectivity, the ahupua'a system, and the, the lifeblood of these, this entire ecosystem that ties it all together, which is fresh water. Um, I think the overall message is that um, is the importance of maintaining the connectivity throughout these ecosystems individually um, as well as a whole and to, to sustain the resiliency of these ecosystems individually and collectively as an island ecosystem in the face of climate change. And that's it. Any questions?